This video will take a little further look into the molecular dynamics program that I've written up here in Python, uh, following along again as usual from my computational chemistry GitHub repository. So I have that running in a Jupyter Notebook as always, same kind of directory structure being replicated locally here. So what we're doing is first we are running molecular dynamics on any given input. So we have this md.py script, kind of just a driver shell, uh, calling a lot of these core functions from this mmlib directory down in scripts molecular mechanics, and basically just uh, creating a simulation object and telling that to run. A lot of that takes place down inside this uh, simulate module down in this mmlib directory in three levels deep inside that repository. And a lot of the uh, main glorious details which occur down there are occurring inside this molecular dynamics class. And that, uh, the most part of that is occurring inside this run function where we're running molecular dynamics. And there's our little loop where we're updating the coordinates, updating the gradient, update the acceleration, update velocities, get the new energy. Uh, some other stuff in there, check if we need to print, in, in, sorry, increment the time, and uh, do that until the end of the simulation. So that's down in the simulate module. And then once we do that, if we run it on some input file, like this uh, carbon monoxide uh, .md input file, I tell it where the molecule is, the co.param, I tell it uh, what the temperature is, uh, if I want some boundary on it, if I want that to be a cube or a sphere, running it for three picoseconds, a uh, 0 0.1 femtosecond time step, how often I print the geometry, how often I print the energy, what files I print those two things to. And then if I run that, um, then I'm going to get output, which is going to look like the following. So I have XYZ files printed at every, uh, looks like every two femtoseconds here, kind of just the XYZ one after another all the way until the end of the simulation at three picoseconds. And then I get the uh, data file where it just says what file that came from, all the information I need to replicate, all of the output, and then all of the energy terms like all of our terms we discussed in molecular mechanics, total, kinetic, potential, non-bonded, bonded, boundary, van der Waals, electrostatic, bond, angle, torsion, and out of plane. So we have those files. And then now what I'm going to do, and I'm going to take a file which is going to use that all as input, saying what was my input file for my MD, and it's going to generate a plot of what the various energy terms look like versus time in this co.pdf file inside this uh, plot md directory. So that's all a mouthful. So let's see if we can't uh, head over here. So we got this analysis.py, which this is just a little driver shell script as well that's uh, going inside this analyze uh, module and running the analysis. And that analysis mostly is going to consist of doing things like um, creating a matplotlib script, which is going to generate our PDF and also uh, computing some average values of all of our different energy components. Okay, so that all seems like a lot. Um, not too much noteworthy in there to take a specific look at. We're going to compute things like average, standard deviation, minimum, and maximum of each of our energy terms. So let's go ahead and do that. So let's see, we got running the script, and I'm going to run that on plot md, and we're going to do this for co.plot. That's going to run for a while. It takes a little bit longer on my laptop. Uh-oh, we got some errors. What's going on? Okay, that was just because I had the file open while I was looking at that. Okay, so I closed the file, and then I ran the script. And the output of this, I get this nice little table, which gives me some summary statistics of all of my different energy terms. So what's my average total energy, kinetic, potential, all those terms that I just mentioned before. What's their average value, their standard deviation, their minimum value, their maximum value. So some things to note. 
hopefully the standard deviation for total energy should be small because total energy should be constant. It should be a conserved value. So hopefully the value of this is small relative to the variations in your kinetic and potential energy. And here we see that our uh, standard deviation of total energy is about a factor of 2,000 smaller than our uh, deviations in kinetic energy. So hopefully this should be at least a factor of 100 or more smaller, so it is. So this means our time steps aren't too big for how uh, far in time we're jumping between each step. And then just other uh, values you might uh, be interested in there. We can also take a look at some of these uh, for various other uh, plots that we've made. So looking at a bunch of trajectories here, some sample molecules you'll have in those directories where the carbon dioxide and other simulations are found. First we have HF, which I have a simulation at basically zero Kelvin where it's just a slow bond vibration. So that you just see that bond vibrating a couple times, zero Kelvin, no translational motion. There's just whatever whatever initial potential energy you had is vibrating in that bond. Our carbon dioxide is at 298, as we mentioned. So that actually is not only uh, vibrating, as you can see the kind of tiny little vibrations going there, but it's also rotating and translating maybe not uh, quite as fast as we'd expect, but that depends on how frequently I'm outputting structures as well and how fast VMD is gonna be running uh, those frames. So we do see it definitely uh, translate and rotate its way across the screen there over the course of those three picoseconds. So one for water, where in addition to uh, rotating and translating, it's vibrating both the bonds and the angle. You can see all three of the kind of modes in which water vibrates are represented in its motions there. We have ethane, which I believe we showed in the other uh, introductory video, where it's got not only the bonds and angles, but also its torsion angle changes a little bit as well. Um, then there's this formaldehyde molecule, which has an out of plane angle. And there, it actually runs long enough where you see it hit the boundary. And when it hits the boundary, the energy kind of redistributes. You get different amounts of rotation, different amounts of vibration, maybe even different amounts of translation due to it interacting with the wall and redistributing the energy between those modes during a collision. All right, uh, lithium fluoride. Uh, these two are non-bonded, but they are uh, interacting electrostatically. And this one you'll see is actually at the limit of my time step is a little bit too big. That collision is pretty violent and there's a little bit of error being incurred in the uh, total energy there, as we'll see in a moment. Helium-2, non-bonded only through van der Waals. Uh, you can see much more slowly, much more slow to interact, a uh, much slower type of uh, vibration going on there. Helium-20, I've got 20 helium atoms, and they're kind of all distributed out through this box. So they start out close together, but at 298 Kelvin, helium is pretty much an ideal gas. This is a, at about one bar of pressure, so they pretty much look like a bunch of independent particles traveling. They look like a bunch of independent particles traveling within our, uh, within our uh, box here. All right, I have... H205, uh, five water molecules uh, that are bound to one another and pretty much sticking. Water is a liquid at these temperatures, so these are pretty much stuck together as they go around in their uh, circle. What else we have? And the last one, we have two benzene molecules where I just have that long enough for them to kind of half rotate once and kind of bounce off each other a little bit. But you do see all of them uh, all of them uh, interacting with our, their internal degrees of freedom vibrating during that as well. Okay, so that's the trajectories of what all these things look like, but what do their graphs of all of these energies look like? So we'll take a look. So in HF, we started out by just having, uh, we're at very low temperatures. See the total energy, the black line is pretty much constant. And then we have this exchange between our bonds energy and our kinetic energy, that's a term our bond being a term of the potential energy. 
kinetic and, and potential exchanging, everything else being at zero and pretty much uh, staying put throughout this entire, uh, this is a couple, this thing is in the way, but it's about uh, 0 0.02 or 20 femtoseconds. For carbon monoxide, um, that's a similar kind of thing. This is basically going back and forth, but um, due to the sampling rate of how frequently I'm outputting, uh, how frequently I'm outputting energies, it gets this kind of distorted shape to it because I'm not uh, printing them out frequently enough. The water, uh, you see the kinetic going in a lot of variation because both the bond energy and the angle energy was varying as you have those uh, variations going on over this one picosecond. We have ethane over the half of a picosecond there similarly and then we have additionally you look near the bottom a little bit of that torsion energy coming up and down. When we start to include collisions with the wall we get that CH2O formaldehyde uh, you get some of this boundary energy showing up, those purple where we have wall collisions showing up there. And then you have the little uh, gray out of plane energy showing up as well. You can see the energy redistributes between the different modes every time we collide with the wall. As I mentioned with the lithium fluoride, you can see there's a little bit of variation in the total energy, and that's because our time step is getting a little bit too big. So it's okay to have that vary a little bit, but this variation is getting a little bit too big. So we have the electrostatic energy, which is varying a lot and does so over quite a long range. Whereas you see the van der Waals energy just shows up over much smaller ranges where the exchange repulsion, that art of the 12th term, is pushing them apart. The helium-2, notice the very small scale here where it's basically just that van der Waals energy and things occurring very slow. This occurred over 10 picoseconds, so very, very slow time scale of interaction there. When I had 20 of them, they were basically all independent. Almost all of our energy was kinetic for almost in all the simulation, just occasionally particles colliding with one another through van der Waals interactions or colliding with the wall through those boundary interactions. Then our uh, non-bonded molecules with those eight, five H2Os in a ring have most of the terms show up here. See the potential, we can finally see it unmasked because all of our terms are starting to show up. We have bonds, angles, uh, those adding up to the bonded terms, the kinetic, our van der Waals in blue, our dark blue non-bonded, including both the electrostatic and the van der Waals term. Um, and Occasionally, it looks like we get a little bit of boundary going on there, a little bit of purple bounce up in there. And then lastly, our benzenes, where um, we have the vibrations of the internal molecule going on, where we have the bonds and the uh, angles, that light green, the torsions in purple, a tiny little bit of out-of-plane energies in gray just above the baseline there. Then we have occasionally when the uh, molecules line up next to one another, you get the, the electrostatic uh, energy fluctuating and the van der Waals as they kind of bump into one another there. So that's kind of a little bit more uh, insight into what's going on with these scripts and some of the things you can use if you decide to uh, come up with your own input file and run it and try to un make sense of what's going on in, in one of these simulations.